want to welcome everybody, welcome Dr. Ben Dean, to the 33rd Annual Alfred Stiernut Lecture, and, and I want to thank the members, uh, my colleagues in the Philosophy and Political Science Department, for continuing this critical tradition that invites public intellectuals and academicians to our campus. Um, we sometimes forget, uh, maybe at our peril, that one of the responsibilities of a university is to foster a critical dialogue among its communities. And those include both our eight schools in the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as our local community. Uh, Cardinal Newman, in the idea of the university, emphasized the necessity of extending the work that is done within the walls of the academy outside those walls in order to promote the greater welfare of those that it served. And I think this lecture series has done that exceedingly well for these 33 years. And it is with much, with much pride that I welcome all of you today uh, to uh, the talk by Dr. Shayla Van Habib. My intuition tells me that her talk is perhaps more urgent and relevant now that we find ourselves so hungry for clear-minded and clear-voiced intellectuals to light our way. Thank you, Dr. Ben Habib, for joining us. And now I'll hand you over to the Chair of Philosophy and Political Science, Dr. Scott McLean, who will formally introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Smart, for that wonderful welcome to all of us. I'm Scott McLean. I'm professor of political science here at Quinnipiac and also chair of the philosophy and political science department. And it is my honor to introduce to you uh, the 33rd annual Stiernot lecturer, Dr. Sheila Ben Habib. And she is Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University. And we at Quinnipiac University are very honored to have Dr. Ben Habib here to challenge our perspectives and provide us with a greater understanding of the world that we have inherited. Dr. Ben Habib is truly a world-class scholar and a rare and valuable interpreter of our late modern social condition, as well as our political condition. She's a global philosopher whose works have been translated into over 10 languages, including Persian, German, Turkish, French, Chinese. Dr. Ben Habib came to this country from her birthplace in Istanbul, Turkey, in 1970 to study at Brandeis University. Uh, when she uh, arrived here, she eventually got her degree from Brandeis and then made her way to Yale Graduate School where she earned a PhD. She's taught at the New School for Social Research and at Harvard University and has made her triumphant return to Yale University as the Eugene Meyer Professor. Now, I simply do not have time and you do not have patience to, uh, to, for me to list all of her many accomplishments and all of her many honors around the world. So I will only mention a few of them to you to get to know her a little better. Professor Ben Abib is the recipient of the Ernst Bloch Prize for, uh, for 2009, which is one of Germany's most prestigious awards in philosophy. And she's also the winner of the Leopold, Leopold Lucas Prize from the theological faculty of the University of uh, Tübingen in 2012. And she's also been a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences since 1995. She's held many impressive and exciting uh, professorships such as the Spinoza Chair in Amsterdam, the Gauss Lecture in, in Princeton, the John Seeley Memorial Lectures at Cambridge, and the Tanner Lectures at the UC Berkeley, and uh, was the uh, Catedra Ferrada Mora Distinguished Professor in Spain. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about her research and maybe put it into some kind of context for you. Dr. Ben Habib's first book, Critique Norman Utopia, which came out in 1986, made a tremendous impression on me personally as a graduate student at Rutgers University. Uh, one of my professors suggested that I read this book because it might help me do a better job of interpreting the critical theory of Theodore Adorno, which I was really having a problem with at the time. And it did help made a tremendous impact on me 
And I, and I found uh, that she had written many books, uh, and many of them uh, extremely enlightening, um, and, and in fact, uh, better and better as she went along. She next launched a series of studies that synthesized a lot of strands of philosophical and political thought, such as the German critical theorist tradition from the Frankfurt School, feminist theory, democratic theory, postmodernism, and starting with her book, The Rights of Others, Alien Citizens and Residents, which came out in 2004, and by the way, won, won the Ralph Bunch Award at the American Political Science Association, so she crosses many disciplinary boundaries. Um, and then moving on to her uh, recent book from 2013, which is Equality and Difference, Human Dignity and Popular Sovereignty in the Mirror of Political Modernity. She takes her point of departure Hannah Arendt's famous formulation found in her book, the, the Origins of Totalitarianism, where Arendt talks about refugees and stateless people who appeal to cosmopolitan ideals. And Arendt uses her famous phrase, they claim the right to have rights. But the tragedy, at least for Arendt, was that their struggle for the right to have rights was always centered on politics and democracy in the nation state, not at the international level. For rent, the right to have rights or human rights was not backed by strong enough sanctions at the international level, and so stateless people were forever, according to rent, at the mercy of or at the benefit of the nation state. And uh, human rights, at least up into our current situation, always depended on the nation state for their power. But Dr. Benabib has taken up the challenge of Arendt and has meditated on how the politics of migration and immigration and refugee status and stateless peoples of all sorts point to visible, palpable fissures between the universalist values and norms of human rights, and the particularities involved in the norms which govern our lives as members of nation states or democracies. Uh, and those kinds of politi politics do not revolve so much around human rights, but around a contradiction which says that nation states have sovereignty to define their national borders and to decide and determine how one becomes a member, or how one achieves standing within that order. The recent news of President Trump's revoking of DACA, which means Deferred Action for, for Childhood Arrivals, and the confusion about whether this will become law, which has at least changed three times in the news today, whether this was a deal uh, that would be passed in uh, the Congress with the Democrats, or would it not be, I think points directly to the problematic that Professor Benabib has, has pointed out for us and raised for us. Um, Dr. Benabib has written that the fissures between cosmopolitan values of human rights and the nationalistic or democratic norms of national sovereignty, democracy, participation might be healed, possibly, by reformulating the idea of membership, of what we owe to strangers and outsiders, and how that can become more in line with democratic political practice, as well as theory. Will you please join me in welcoming our honored guest here, Dr. Shayla Benabi. Um, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful invitation. 33 years of a named lecture is a tradition, and I'm honored to be the 33rd in the, in the series. And thank you for your gracious introductions, and thank you, uh, Scott, for this very substantial uh, introduction of me into my, uh, into my lecture now. Uh, there is a handout.
for you to be able to follow the quotations I'm going to use. And uh, this is not a PowerPoint lecture. I'm just going to uh, introduce a few images uh, to you. And that's why the screen is uh, on. The title of my lecture is Reflections on Hannah Arendt's the Right to Have Rights on Migrants and Refugees in Contemporary Political Thought. In the first two decades of the 21st century, it is astonishing that the fate of refugees and asylum seekers would emerge as a worldwide problem. In an age when the movement of everything across borders, from capital to fashion, from information to news, from germs to money has intensified, human mobility continues to be criminalized. The refugee is increasingly treated not only as an alien body, but as the enemy who is interned in detention camps, in deportation sites, or in the absurd language of the European bureaucracy gathered in hotspots. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees notes that at the end of 2015, the number of forcibly displaced persons both in their own country and across international borders stood at 65.3 million, the highest level on record. With no end in sight to conflicts in places such as Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the number at the end of 2016, those figures are not yet up, most likely stands at about 67 million people. Worldwide, one in every 113 person is displaced. Among these 67 million people, which is a very uh, uh, aggregate figure, 21.3 million are refugees who have crossed international borders. 38 million are internally displaced people who have not crossed the borders. 20 million people are stateless, whether they reside within their own country or outside their own country. That is, as puzzling as this may seem, the nature of contemporary civil wars and conflicts as such that people are rendered stateless within the territory in which they reside because they belong to different ethnic or religious groups. As these numbers have grown, not only has the number of camps increased the world over, but camps have ceased to be places where one held people temporarily, rather camps have become semi-permanent. The largest refugee camp in the world is in Kenya, Dadaab. It is 20 years old and it houses 420,000 refugees. The Palestinian refugee camps in southern Lebanon are in either 70 or 50 years old, depending on whether the refugee population was created after the 1948 or the 1968 wars. The refugees who live in these camps, and in some cases who have spent their entire lives there, there are now third generation refugees, become PRSs, that is, those in protected refugee situation according to the language of the United Nations. As you well know, President Trump has recently taken various executive decisions suspending the entry in particular of Syrian refugees into the United States. Uh, he reduced the number recently to about 50,000, okay? The number keeps shrinking. This may be part of the DACA deal, I'm not sure. He, President Trump has also frozen the visas of nationals of Iraq, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen until the various courts has, have interfered. But the status of individuals from these countries, and in particular their relatives, is still in a murky football between the various, uh, among the various courts. And finally, as was mentioned, the DACA program has been uh, terminated only, uh, but it has been extended for another six months until Congress passes legislation regularizing the status 
of these young people, and this is now being negotiated. But in effect, uh, these developments are part of a larger trend. Since September 11, 2001, the United States has instituted a new form of migration regime, which legal scholars refer to as crim migration, that is criminalization and migration, crim migration. Under this new regime, not only have deportations of so-called aliens with criminal records, big or small, increased, but many families also have been torn apart through the deportation of either undocumented parents or their children. And I regret to inform you that during President Obama's administration, these deportations and some of these practices were also established. Um, so there is some kind of continuity of which we are not always as aware as we should be. Refugees, SILEs, stateless persons, IDPs, internally displaced persons, PRSs, those in protected refugee situations, DACAs, these are new categories of human beings created by an international state system in turmoil. They are subject to a special kind of precarious existence, and their plight reveals the most fateful disjunction between so-called human rights and the rights of the citizen, between the universal claim to human dignity and the specificities of indignity suffered by those who possess only their human rights, but not citizenship rights. The condition of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants has not been a much discussed topic in political philosophy. The state-centric assumption of much modern political thought has blinded us to the significance of borders and the movements of people across them. Normative questions of transnational movement of peoples have not always been separated out in the recent literature on Justice, for example, on global distributive justice uh, does not pay attention so, uh, so much to the movement of peoples as it does to the global redistribution of wealth or uh, goods. A notable exception to this blindness of political philosophy has been Hannah Arendt, 1906, 1975. Now, I'm going to assume uh, some degree of knowledge, but may I please see hands on the part of the students who know something about Arendt? Students? I, well, you have to put her into your curriculum. Okay, if that's the case, I'm just going to give you a few biographical details, which I hadn't intended to, but uh, okay, this is Arendt. And this is her later on. She was born in Hanover, Germany, to a German Jewish family in 1906. The family moves to Königsberg, the birthplace of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. In 1924, the young Arendt decides to go to Marburg to study uh, philosophy. There is a rumor that there is a real philosopher, again, maybe one can learn to think. Do you know who that is? Martin Heidegger, thank you. She is a student of Martin Heidegger's and as those of you who have at least seen the, the movie about uh, her, which is quite okay, she meets Martin Heidegger. They have an affair. Uh, Heidegger recommends to her that she leave for Heidelberg where uh, she meets Ka the philosopher Karl Jaspers. And in 1929, she writes her dissertation on the concept of love in St. Augustine, and she writes it in Latin. Now, Arendt gets involved in Jewish politics as early as 1928, when she meets Kurt Blumenfeld, and this involvement continues until Judah Magnus's death in 1958, and uh, it resumes in 1963 with Eichmann in Jerusalem, a title which I'm sure you have heard about and which brings her great notoriety. And in fact, after this, she uh, stops writing about Jewish politics. But in 
1933, Arendt is arrested for a brief period of time in Berlin, where she's been collecting some literature about the anti-Semitic organizations of major professional associations. And she uh, manages to escape Germany via Prague uh, to Paris with her elderly mother. Uh, just two more steps. Here in Paris, she meets her second husband, Heinrich Blücher, who is a member of the Spartacus Party, the party that followed Rosa Luxemburg in Germany. And with the defeat of France, both she and her husband are spent to the camp at Gors, G-U-R-S. This is a camp that has a woman section and a male section, and it is a camp that also holds uh, prisoners from the Spanish Civil War. It is not an extermination camp, but individuals from Gors are sent to Auschwitz in buses. Arendt escapes, and she escapes across uh, the Pyrenees uh, into Spain and to Portugal, and with the help of the American Friends Services Committee, she manages to take the boat from Lisbon in 1941. Okay? She's on a list of uh, European intellectuals that the American Friends Services Committee is trying to save from. Europe. So much for the detail. I have a new book uh, coming out called Playing Chess with History, which is a little bit about this, uh, this life uh, there uh, in uh, France and in uh, Spain. So uh, let us now turn with this biographical background in mind to Arendt's famous analysis of the right to have rights in her masterpiece, The Origins of Totalitarianism. I want to begin by discussing the philosophical perplexities of Arendt's phrase. My first question will be, what is the conceptual structure of the phrase, the right to have rights? Second, how does Arendt justify rights in general? And what are the various dimensions of the loss of rights that Arendt distinguishes? In the second half of my lecture, uh, I will put Arendt's formulations in the light of international, in, in the light of developments in international human rights law in the post-World War II period. And in the conclusion, I will circle back to uh, a, a consideration of uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, significant, uh, uh, maybe also for feminist theory today, uh, briefly. So let's begin with the first passage in your handout. Okay. In this much cited passage from the origins of totalitarianism, first published in the UK as the burden of our times, Arendt writes, we become aware of the existence of a right to have rights and that means to live in a framework where one is judged by one's actions and opinions and their right to belong to some kind of organized community. Only one millions of people emerge who had lost and could not regain these rights because of the new global political situation. The right that corresponds to this loss and that was never even mentioned among the human rights cannot be expressed in the categories of the 18th century because they presume that rights spring from the nature of man. The right to have rights, or the right of every individual to belong to humanity, should be guaranteed by humanity itself. It is by no means certain whether this is possible." End of quote. So let me begin by parsing this passage uh, for you. When Arendt writes of the right to have rights, is the term right being used in the same fashion in the two halves of this phrase? A right means a claim addressed by a person or an agent, let's say X, to other persons or agents Y 
to do or to refrain from doing certain things. For example, I do not have a right to prevent you from driving your car in the highway if you obey the speed limits and other traffic signals, and if I'm not a traffic cop or whatever, I wouldn't have the right to stop you in any event. So rights relations are relations among individuals entitled to do certain things and addressees who have to act in certain ways with respect to that entitlement. Once you are a citizen, a lawful resident or a visitor in a country, for example, and I'm sure there are many of you who are non-US citizens but visitors, visiting students here, you have a right to certain things, including the use of schools, hospitals, libraries, etc. Okay? So you have a right to, let's say, A, B, C, and D in virtue of being X. But what does it mean to argue that you have a right to have rights? Okay? You have a right to the use of your car, you have a right to the use of library privileges, you have a right to go to a hospital. Who is being addressed in the claim that you have a right to have rights? Does aren't simply mean that you have a right to nationality? Is the right to have rights a claim that you should be recognized as a uh, citizen? She says the right to have rights is the right to the claim to be recognized as a member of the human community. But exactly which community, which specific community? But then she adds at the end of this quote, well, it's not by at all possible whether humanity can guarantee your right to have rights. So the first question then is, in what sense is Arendt using this, this locution? Uh, the second question is, how is she justifying rights? As we know, this is one of the most difficult questions in political philosophy at large. Many answers have been given to this since the beginning of modern political thought with Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, uh, etc. Throughout this discussion, Arendt herself polemicizes against the grounding of human rights upon any conception of human nature or history. For her, conceptions of human nature commit the mistake of treating humans, she says, as if they were mere substance, as if they were things in nature. But following St. Augustine and Heidegger, for her, humans are the ones for whom the question of being has become a question. She says, she quotes Augustine, quid ergo sum Deus meus quae natura sum? What then am I my God? What is my nature? My nature is simply, she says, questo mihi factus sum, I have become a question to myself. So for a being who has become a question to itself, there is no nature as such in which she claims rights can be grounded. But this implies a capacity for self-questioning and uh, one's freedom and this is what differentiates us from other substances uh, in uh, nature as such. So Arendt distinguishes between the human condition and any static understanding of human nature. Although human freedom for her is not limitless, it is subject to the facticity of the human condition. What does she mean by the human condition? Namely that we are born into a world, that we are born of others like us, and we perform human activities, labor, work, and action. So for her, if there is any justification of the right to have rights, it must be with reference to the human condition alone. Now, very briefly, uh, why not then say that uh, Human history shows us that rights are justified, that eventually in history as a consequence of various revolutions, we learn that human beings 
are capable of exercising and maybe entitled to certain rights. Arendt is very skeptical about any philosophy of history, and in her work, this usually takes uh, the form of a polemic with and against uh, Karl Marx. And for her, any account of history, either privileging a mechanism of social forces that act as the engines of change, or any teleological philosophy that attributes to history an end goal, let's say progress, is intellectually shallow. Even more, she thought that any such philosophy of history, particularly either of the Hegelian kind or of the more orthodox Marxist kind, uh, runs the danger of making humans into instruments of developments and trends that they are not aware of and robs them of oppositional agency. What then is Arendt's own philosophical justification of the right to have rights? Uh, if neither nature nor history can serve as a justification, uh, what do we appeal to? Some have interpreted Arendt as a political existentialist or as a decisionist, and look at quote number two, where she writes, our political life rests on the assumption that we can produce equality through organization because man can act and change and build a common world together with his equals, only with his equals. We are not born equal, we become equal as members of a group on the strength of our decision to guarantee ourselves mutually equal rights. So what Arendt here seems to be suggesting is that we become equal by establishing new institutions, by generating a, a political commonwealth in which we guarantee each other equality. But the establishment of every new institution involves some degree of exclusion also. There is always the we and the they. There is always those of us who are full citizens and those others. So the establishment of new institutions does not solve the problem of us and them or we or they. Uh, I think this is closer to, to Arendt's eventual solution to this problem, but at the moment, let's point out that it does not, uh, it does not uh, preclude uh, the question of exclusion. Now, there is another interpretation of Arendt. As you can see, I'm, I'm teasing you a little bit. I'm not going to just give you, you know, the sort of pet answers. The question is here, careful, careful reading of these passages. And another reading of Arendt is that Arendt really did not believe in any natural rights and that she was closer to Edmund Burke, for whom the only rights that exist are the rights of the Frenchman, Englishman, entailments. Look at quote number three, where she says, these facts and reflections, referring to herself, offer what seem an ironical, bitter, and belated confirmation of the famous arguments with which Edmund Burke opposed the French Revolution's Declaration of the Rights of Man. According to Burke, the rights we enjoy spring from within the nation so that neither natural law nor divine command nor any concept of mankind such as Robespierre's human race the sovereign of the earth, etc., are needed as a source of law, end of quote. But surely this cannot be Arendt's meaning because if all she wanted to say was that rights were conventional entitlements granted to human beings by an existing legal system, then the whole concept of the right to have rights would be rendered meaningless. Hannah Arendt, unlike Jeremy Bentham then and Alistair McIntyre in our times, does not consider human rights to be nonsense upon stilts in Jeremy Bentham's famous uh, uh, formulation. So let me add here, without pursuing uh, this vein much further, we can take it up in the discussion, that I think Arendt's uh, uh, 
anti-foundationalism does not permit her a very clear philosophical answer to the justification of rights. I have said in my own work that there is a lack of normative foundations in Arendt's uh, work and that we have to expand further some of these insights that she has uh, formulated. But I will leave those problems uh, where they are and I will not try to, to solve them. Now, I want to now change uh, a, a framework of analysis and I want to begin looking at Arendt's claims experientially and institutionally. Okay? Now let's look at quote number four. The fundamental deprivation of human rights is manifested first of all in the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinions significant and actions effective. This extremity and nothing else is the situation of people deprived of human rights. They are deprived not of the right to freedom, but of the right to action, not of the right to think whatever they please, but of the right to opinion. What does it mean to be deprived of the right to action and opinion? There is, in Arendt's uh, words, an experiential, a phenomenological, and as well as an institutional dimension which goes to the heart of her theory of the public sphere. For Arendt, a place in the world is always the space within which human behavior and action takes place and thought and opinion are communicated because, she adds, humans cannot exist but by appearing to each other. The human condition unfolds in a space of appearances in which we act, speak, and interact. But the space of appearances is not always institutionalized as a public political sphere. Only under certain conditions does the space of appearance become a public sphere with its own institutions, laws, and demarcations from other realms. For Arendt, the stateless, the refugee, and the displaced persons are said to be deprived not of the right to freedom, but of the right to action, not of the right to think whatever they please, but of the right to opinion. Strictly speaking, such individuals, particularly under conditions of internment camps, are of course deprived of freedoms to act in certain ways. So Arendt's formula is in some ways strange. But they are deprived of the right to action and the right to opinion in the sense that they lack an institutional framework through which what they say and do can be heard, evaluated, and respond to by others. Individuals under conditions of internment, concentration, deportation camps, have ceased to be the source of recognized validity claims, which can only be parsed with respect to a shared public framework in the world. Capacities for responsibility and agency are diminished. Such individuals face the threat of becoming worldless, worldless, precisely because they have no demonstrable institutional and interactional framework within which they can be situated. This aspect of the diminution of the person and the increasing sense of unreality that goes through life in concentration, deportation camps, have been explored primarily through works of literature by Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, Imre Kertes, and others. It has been basically novelists and chroniclers who have, been explaining, who have explained to us most successfully this dimension of worldlessness and loss of action and opinion that Arendt is referring to. Arendt was well aware of the work of social psychologists such as Bruno uh, Bettelheim, who had also studied the phenomenon of the camps. And in some of her reflections about the right to have rights, 
She moves between a phenomenology of worldlessness, the experience of worldlessness, and the more institutional question of the loss of a public, uh, public sphere. What kind of moral and political agency can we attribute to human beings who are in the process of losing their place in the world? It is clear that in camps as well, human action and words do not cease. And humans have not really lost all their capacity for action and opinion. But the oft noted phenomenon of depression, listlessness, staring into the void, disassociation in thought among camp inmates proves that Arendt's phenomenology, this phenomenon of worldlessness was quite apt, and I'm just claiming that this comes uh, to voice uh, in particular in quote number four, if you want to read it again. Let me now turn to the institutional and legal dimensions of Arendt's discussion. Okay? So far, I've gone through the philosophical and the phenomenological dimensions. Since Hannah Arendt penned her discussion of the right to have rights, internal national institutions and international law have changed the landscape against the background of which she wrote. Uh, look at the, our item five. The Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 in Articles 13, 14, and 15 addresses some of the questions formulated uh, by uh, Arendt's reflections. Article 13 reads, Everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. That is, there is a right to emigrate. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return. But there is no right to immigrate, that is, to enter another country. There is a, a symmetry there, which is the source of a lot of uh, legal issues. Article 14 encodes the right of asylum. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution, but this right may not be invoked in the case of prosecutions genuinely arising from non-political crimes or from acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. In other words, if you are an ordinary criminal, you can't just go and claim asylum. There are conditions for uh, being able to claim asylum. Now, Article 15 seeks guarantees against denaturalization or the loss of citizenship. It says everyone has the right to a nationality and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality nor denied the right to change his nationality. The conditions of refugees and asylum seekers, so in the post-war period, have been addressed more specifically by the 1951 Geneva Convention on the State of Refugees. And as uh, many of you, I'm sure, know, the, United, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is hortatory, but what becomes binding law in the international sphere are two major human rights covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which are the international law that expand and bind on the signatory states um, um, these uh, universal uh, rights uh, claims. So the legal landscape for the entitlement to and exercise of the rights that concerned Hannah Arendt has changed. Article 15 of the UDHR, that denaturalization and rendering human beings stateless is a violation of international human rights, is in complete agreement with Arendt's intentions. The obverse side of denaturalization, that a state has obligation not to render individuals stateless, is naturalization or gaining access to citizenship or to some kind of permanent membership or residency in a polity. So I haven't parsed this out completely, but I'm just going to throw this out. With respect to DACA, 
One of the things that will need to be tested if no compromise is reached is whether, in effect, there will be some individuals who will be rendered stateless if the United States does not offer them protection because their country of origin may not have be taking them in or because their parents and themselves may have left their country of origin as refugees and may not be able to regain citizenship. So this is something that we have to watch about, whether one of the unintended consequences of this action would once again go against the grain of international law, but unfortunately it would not be the first time that the United States in recent history violates international human rights uh, agreements. So naturalization, as we see, is uh, not guaranteed by international law. That is, although international law says rendering individuals stateless is against international human rights, international law does not say that specific states have obligations to give individual citizenship and under what conditions. This remains a sovereign privilege, okay? And Arendt herself was acutely aware that although the developments in international human rights law were absolutely necessary to address the plight of the stateless, she continued uh, to believe that international law would only be con concerned with um, bilateral laws and treaties or regulate relations of sovereign nations, and she was a skeptic that, in effect, international law could regulate uh, state sovereignty. So ironically then, the existence of these international treaties and the institutions they have created have not much altered the behavior of states, nor have they completely altered the condition of refugees. Okay? I want to focus now on this, on this irony. And nowhere is this continuing tension between sovereignty transcending rights claims and sovereignty norms more apparent than in the case still of the major legal instruments of the post-war period regulating refugee and asylum movements. The 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol creates distinctions between what are called convention refugees and persons displaced on account of civil war, generalized violence, or natural catastrophes. So uh, a, a refugee, uh, as a result of catastrophic climactic transformation, is not a convention refugee according to the existing definitions in international law. On the one hand, it is stated, quote, the principle of non refoulement that is not rendering an individual back to the country uh, uh, from which uh, he or she has escaped. On the one hand, it, the principle of non refoulement is so fundamental that no reservations or derogations may be made from it. It provides that no one shall es expel or return a refugee against his or her will in any manner whatsoever to a territory where he or she fears threats to life or freedom. I was quoting here from the 1951 convention. But this injunction not to render a refugee to conditions where they fear for their life or freedom is then uh, limited by the creation of so-called five protected categories. Race, Religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion are the so-called protected categories and you can claim refugee status if you can prove persecution or discrimination on this, on this basis. With the leadership of Canada and then the United States, these categories were recently expanded to cover gender-based and gender-related crimes such as female genital mutilation and practices of child marriage as uh, well. But in general, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the convention refugee has been modeled after the dissident, the prisoner of conscience, and the resistance fighter. The convention refugee needs to prove 
individual persecution. And this imposes on refugees themselves and the receiving states quite a heavy administrative procedure of examination and verification. And this is one of the reasons why in Greece, for example, there is such a sort of backlog, if you wish, of refugees trying to enter continental Europe because the burden of proof is so high to prove that you are a convention refugee and the Greek government basically says they do not have the staff trained in international law to be able to let these refugees pass uh, uh, borders. Now, there have been some recent uh, developments uh, both in Africa and in Latin America which have tried to expand this definition of the refugee, but maybe I'm getting too much into the details here of international law, and let me come back to some of the more uh, general questions. Neither the 1951 Refugee Convention nor the legal instruments that have been created since then recognize conditions of extreme poverty and material deprivation as grounds for legitimate asylum. Economic migrants are viewed as individuals who raise spurious claims to protection and refuge. So the economic migrant is radically distinguished, particularly in Europe, from the refugee and asylum seeker. But why are extreme poverty and material deprivation itself not legitimate grounds for seeking opportunities to escape them? Particularly under conditions of global economic interdependence, when the policies of advanced capitalist economies and the damage they cause to the environment all over the globe have far-reaching consequences, what sense does it mean to turn so-called economic migrants away at the door, or better still, as is the practice in Europe, to douse them with water cannons or set police dogs uh, upon them. Not redressing extreme poverty, in my opinion, violates just as fundamental a human right as does uh, torture. So this is one of the blind spots of international law, this distinction between the convention refugee and the economic migrant. Furthermore, the subject of human rights is the individual person. Even if the circumstances and causes leading individuals to seek refuge and asylum are always collective. In centering on the individual, the law is forced to neglect the interdependence of economic military, climate-related factors in the society of states which give rise to these collective circumstances. Okay. That is, refugees are created as a consequence of structural and systematic factors in the society of states. Finally, laws and legal regimes create further differentiations and distinctions that trap individuals in conditions of administrative dependency. This aspect of legal governmentality, which generates such distinctions among displaced persons, refugees in protracted situations, stateless persons, is a double-edged sword, often robbing individuals of the autonomy, dignity, and initiative which the protection of their human rights was intended to guarantee. Refugee camps, whether in Deserts, forests, or borders are sites of indignity and humiliation. To the elaborate game of head counting, status granting, and legal classification has in the meantime spawned a transnational set of institutions as well as creating armies of aid workers, humanitarians, camp directors, international lawyers, in addition to hundreds of NGOs and INGOs. These limitations of legal instruments together with the apparatus of legal governmentality give rise to what is being called increasingly the pitfalls of humanitarian reason. What is humanitarian reason? Quote number seven. Didier Fassin, to whom we owe this term, who is currently at the Institute for Advanced Study, defines it as follows. 
Humanitarian reason governs precarious lives. The lives of the unemployed and the asylum seeker, the lives of sick immigrants and people with AIDS, the lives of disaster victims and victims of conflict, threatened and forgotten lives that humanitarian government brings into existence by protecting and revealing them. Fassin worked for many years before we became a professor of sociology and anthropology at Princeton with the remarkable international organization called Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. And he is brutally honest about the shortcomings of humanitarian reason. Again, he writes, I don't have this quote, I have tried to grasp what humanitarian reason means and what it hides, to take it neither as the best of all possible governments nor as an illusion that misleads us. It seems to me that by viewing it from various angles, we can render the global logic of humanitarian reason more intelligible." End of quote. In other words, what I'm suggesting in agreement with uh, Didier Fassin is that we have to be skeptical about the capacity of legal instrumentation alone to address the problems of refugees and asylum seekers in our world. And yet at the same time, we have to understand what I will call in a minute the enabling Juris generative dimensions of the law as well. Because some things have changed in our world as compared to Hannah Arendt's time. The refugee, the asylum seeker, and the stateless person are increasingly aware, aware of the rights that are denied to them. The so-called les sans-papiers without papers in France, who were youth without papers that basically closed themselves up in churches to call attention to their predicament, the dreamers in the United States who militate for their right to uh, enter institutions of higher learning and to gain civil status in this country. And in Spain, los indignados, the indignant ones, many of whom are migrant workers. These are movements of individuals who are demanding the rights that they do not seem to have according to the states in which they may be residing, but which they claim to have as human beings and in accordance with various international human rights uh, conventions. These are the rights to work, to schooling for children, to healthcare, a spe speedy resolution of asylum applications, representation via counsel in the courts in their own language, during intake interviews, etc. Today's refugees and asylum seekers are aware of these rights under international law, also because of the remarkable solidarity exercised by many so civil society groups and organizations. Because of such solidarity, these individuals do not hesitate to invoke these rights in the face of recalcitrant and hostile border guards and policemen. And one of the most memorable examples of this is when in recent years, when refugees from Syria were trying to cross the border to Hungary, in some cases to go further to Germany, to Scandinavia, etc., and Hungarian Prime Minister Orban not only closed the border, but he also set out you know, water cannons and police dogs there were citizens, Hungarian citizens, lined up all throughout the border areas and the roads saying, we are ashamed of our prime minister, please forgive us, okay? So I'm referring to also civil society activism uh, that is joining hands and trying to inform uh, these individuals of their own rights and claims. And equally, we saw a version of this when as a result of President Trump's first um, executive orders uh, banning uh, refugees from mainly Muslim countries, international lawyers as well as groups of activists flooded uh, 
uh, at Kennedy Airport, Logan Airport, and the most, the, my favorite is that migrant taxi workers in New York, you know, refused to take passengers on, on that day, okay? So we, we have this remarkable phenomenon of civil society solidarity um, um, with uh, these groups. And I want to say that there is a sense in which then new legal developments, international and humanitarian law can also create what I'm calling a Juris generative effect. And this is the final quote. By this I mean the following, Juris generativity. Laws acquire meaning in that they are interpreted within the context of certain rules and significations, which often cannot be controlled. There can be no rules without interpretation. Rules can only be followed insofar as they are interpreted. But there are also no rules, including legal norms, which can control the varieties of interpretation each rule can be subject to within all different hermeneutical contexts. In a sense, law's normativity does not consist in the grounds of its formal validity, i.e. legality alone. Law can also structure an extra-legal, political, and cultural universe by developing new vocabularies for public claim making, by giving individuals the new language of rights, by encouraging new forms of subjectivity, encouraging new legal persons to engage with the public sphere, and by interjecting power relations, existing power relations, with forms of justice to come. As Derrida says, avenir means to come, both future and avenir to come. Law, in this sense, is not a method of coercion and an instrument of domination alone. Undoubtedly, this is one of the functions of law. But law can also act as an instrument for the politics of what I call Eurus uh, generativity. And uh, international humanitarian law and international law has created possibilities for the stateless, the refugee and the asylum seeker to negotiate the line between being an abject subject of compassion and being a political activist raising claims to the recognition of his or her international human rights. So let me conclude by returning to Hannah Arendt. What makes Arendt's reflections on the right to have rights so compelling are the various dimensions it addresses at once. For the philosophical purists, her non-foundationalism and lack of clarity concerning rights will present a problem, or let me say for my analytical philosophy colleagues. Nevertheless, this phrase evokes so much and can be dealt with at so many levels at once that it will continue to enlighten us as we continue to face the political conundrums of our own days. For Arendt, freedom is world building with others and it requires a place in the world within which we are situated in networks of action and interaction with others. It's only because we are bodies in space that we also need a place in the world. Although Arendt has frequently been misread as if she wanted to dispense with embodiment, particularly by recent feminist theory, this is not correct. For Arendt, the human condition is deeply embodied and embedded in the webs of narratives and spaces of appearance that can only be housed in a material world, as she puts it, constituted through the labor of our bodies and the work of our hands, in John Locke's words. This conception of embodied agency is not only compatible with contemporary feminist theories, insights into embodiment, but we should also not forget that Arendt is the theorist of natality, which she explicitly juxtaposed to what I call the Western philosophical tradition's love affair with death from Socrates to Heidegger. Natality for her does not only mean dependency and the precarity of human beings, but also the ontological fact that no human child who is ever born, not even twins, will be like any other in their actions and words. This embodied capacity for human agency requires a place in the world. 
in and through which it can involve, uh, unfold. And this is the point at which contemporary migration and refugee studies and feminist theory can meet and cooperate. The world's refugee camps are mostly housed by women and children who are more vulnerable than men because of their bodily needs and more dependent upon a stable place in the world than their male counterparts who are far more mobile. More children than adults die in refugee camps and women in camps are subject to sexual assault, prostitution, abuse, and sexual trafficking. In this sense, analyzing the gender politics of the right to have rights and to address the gender complexities of humanitarian reason is our task ahead. And let us say that Hannah Arendt started us on this path, although she herself did not complete it. Thank you for listening. Again. doing is I will have that microphone and I'll be going up and down the stairs and passing it over to students up there who want to uh, ask questions. Students get to go first. Anyone else who's down lower can come down to this podium and ask a question there. So do we have any students who would like to uh, ask the first question? say like if she's arguing that human rights are more of a, like a protective against like institution or of a like equality like within society does that make sense uh, yeah but just uh, I, I didn't quite hear the very beginning of your sentence could you repeat it yeah um, so I was just asking if you would say that like if Arden is arguing that our human rights are uh, like for equality within the society or if they're to protect us against institutions such as like the government and whatnot? Well, um, rights always uh, have these various aspects, don't they? I mean, uh, uh, citizens' rights are generally uh, rights to uh, e equality, right? We, we talk about the right to non-discrimination. We talk about equal standing in the court of law, in the eyes of uh, justice. But we also have rights in liberal democratic societies to uh, privacy, privacy of association, to privacy of individual partnership, and in the case of the American tradition, of course, we have an extremely expansive interpretation of the First Amendment, which, uh, protect or regulates uh, a government's prerogative to limit uh, speech. I mean, many other countries do not have, for example, as, um, a, as large or as a, an expansive, generous interpretation of the First Amendment. For example, both in the UK and in uh, France, that are liberal democracies, libel is regulated it is, you know, justiciable in the courts. I can take you to court for insulting my reputation, for defaming, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different legal traditions in liberal, in different liberal, liberal constitutions. And some rights are, of course, rights to various entitlements and to various kinds of goods, rights of equality. Other rights are rights to uh, the protection of individual and you know, autonomy, that they are rights which limit government. And I don't think that there is a single constitution that wouldn't have a combination of both 
kinds of, of rights. Does that answer your question? Okay, okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, how is refugee status uh, determined when thousands of civilians are fleeing from an armed conflict? Yes, good question. The determination of refugee status uh, um, is uh, at the moment one of the one of the most contested issues on the ground. If you talk to you know to international lawyers or international aid workers, uh, what happens the, and is that in the refugee camps there are United Nations representatives, you know, uh, representatives of UNHCR. There are representatives of other NGOs. Uh, the uh, religious organizations play a big role here. Individuals can submit applications to the recognition of refugee status. Increasingly, it is the head of household that is submitting, that is submitting the application. So when the United States, for example, grants refugee status, let's say to the 50,000, 100,000 Syrians, these are individuals who have been vetted in the camps. That's why I think um, much of the fear about refugees being potential ISIS terrorists is nonsense, okay? Precisely because, and I'll make a qualification in a minute, because this, uh, within the United States, to come to the United States, there is a period of about two to three waiting you know, years. And the vetting process is extremely complicated. But it's a little bit more porous within the European context, precisely because of the possibility of moving, let's say, from Syria. Take, you can cross the Turkish border if you are not caught by the guards in the early stages of the conflict. You can cross, you used to be able to cross by boat to Greece, or you could go overland you know, to uh, uh, Bulgaria, okay? In some cases like this, there have been some ISIS fighters who have infiltrated refugees movement. This has happened more in Europe. But one has to be careful because this language is the language of the politics of, of fear. And it is clear that this is a political struggle and that some individuals have used the possibility of refugee, refugee uh, movements and the claims of refugees for this. It is, I have never heard of such a case in the context of US refugees. And I think even the examples within Europe are quite, quite limited. So we have to be very careful and very alert to this politics of fear which has surrounded us since uh, 2001, September 11th, that the refugee is the terrorist the stranger and the other, okay? Hi. Um, do you believe that people, um, most notably Americans, have some sort of moral obligation to advocate politically for laws that may establish things like human rights for not just, you know, because of how much of a say the United States has in the United Nations, do you believe the average American has a moral obligation to advocate for those sort of things on local political levels, national political levels, and international political levels? Yes, to all three. <laughs> I like that question. Uh, in what is that moral obligation uh, grounded? Okay, I think this is this is a very hard question in moral philosophy. What do we owe uh, uh, strangers? I uh, think uh, the only plausible answer that one can give to this is uh, our condition of shared humanity, 
and uh, the realization, the realization that uh, this shared humanity means also that we have to act in such a way that the maximum of our actions can be, can be a universal principle for all. That is, we have to potentially imagine, to speak with Kant, a world in which we ourselves were the asylum seekers and the refugees and no door was open to us. Would that be a human and a reasonable world? So that I would try to justify our moral obligation in that way. But moral obligations are always limited by other kind of considerations. And be it in moral philosophy and in, pol in politics, the question is, uh, even when rec recognizing that obligation, what kind of reasonable limits are there? Uh, is, uh, uh, it, you know, what are the, the trade-offs? Take some discussions, right? If a country has very high levels of unemployment, does it have a moral obligation in the first place to, let's say, the starving cotton farmer from, from Africa, or does it have the moral obligation to its own citizens, right? This is always the question of balancing. Uh, uh, balancing. Uh, what I would say is that, of course, there are some legitimate grounds of self-interest. There could be no moral reasoning that did not recognize it. But very often, very often, what happens in these discussions is uh, that uh, there is a, a lack of information uh, about, about these, about these trade-offs, okay? It is simply not the case that the person who is admitted as a refugee or an asylum seeker takes the job of someone who, you know, or the position of someone who is unemployed. It depends on what the policy is in that particular country.